Okay, good evening. So uh, today, um, I'd like to share our experience with how we've adopted time series forecasting in the context of FinOps and Kubernetes, uh, starting all the way uh, from a node level all the way up to uh, our entire fleet in order to reduce costs when managing large quantities of pods. My name is Irvin, and unfortunately today, I won't be joined by my colleague Nicholas, uh, who was unable to attend KubeCon today this time. Uh, a large portion of today's sharing was also prepared by him, and I would be pre presenting his findings and insights on behalf of you guys to, uh, today. So just a quick introduction, both of us are platform engineers working within the engineering infrastructure division at Shopee. Before we get started, I would like to give a brief introduction about our company. So we're from Shopee, which is an e-commerce company operating in several markets worldwide. Today, we are the leading e-commerce uh, platform in Southeast Asia, Taiwan, and Brazil. We are also the number one shopping app in these markets uh, by average monthly active users, as well as total time spent in app. In Shopee, we've used Kubernetes to manage and orchestrate large numbers of pods that power the backend systems behind Shopee. Today, we have over 100,000 pods running across tens of thousands of nodes distributed across multiple data centers worldwide. And we also expect th that these numbers will continue growing as uh, the company grows in the years to come. Unfortunately, managing such large numbers of pods usually mean needing a large number of machines to support them as well. And by extension, this would uh, cost us millions of dollars per quarter. As such, one of the main objectives in FinOps is to find solutions to optimize the usage of our existing resources in order to continue supporting an ever-growing number of containers while minimizing the physical resource requirements, thus limiting the increase in financial costs involved from the underlying infrastructure. By observing resource utilization patterns we found within our clusters, we found several common cases uh, of resource wastage which could lead to uh, underutilized resources. So in Shopee, our resources are provisioned based on the requirement to support campaign events that happen around once a month. And as such, most of our critical services would need to have a sufficient buffer in their resources. And at the same time, since we host our machines on premise, uh, provisioning a large quantity of pods on such short notice is usually uh, quite impractical. And hence, we usually have to reserve some resources that need to remain unallocated in the event that we need to massively scale up during unexpectedly large traffic spikes during these campaigns. On, on, uh, secondly, uh, most of our services also exhibit usage patterns that follow uh, that of our end users, which are mostly concentrated in just a handful of time zones across the Southeast Asian and Latin American time zones. As such, we usually see a lower utilization during off-peak periods when our users are asleep, which means that we usually have tens of thousands of CPU cores just sitting idle during those times, as you can see. So how can we make our resources more efficient? So this is one approach we took from a node level, and let's just try to visualize this from a diagram here. So in blue over here, we can see that this is the actual CPU utilization in use, and the orange portion represents the allocated but currently unused portion of the pod CPU request. And at the same time, we also have a portion of the node CPU resources that remain unallocated. So what we did is very simple, very simple. We just monitored the amount of unused resources on the node and advertised this unused portion or the orange portion via an extended resource. So I'll just show an example shortly. We can then make use of these reclaimed resources to run much more workloads on top of just simply just the unallocated portion, which is really small. So just, this is just an example of what the advertised uh, extended resource might look like. Uh, over here, you can see that uh, we advertise a batch CPU of 30 cores. And then this way, we can actually run pods that don't consume any uh, allocatable CPU. Instead, it consumes the extended resource, the batch CPU resource that we have reclaimed earlier. And uh, this way, we actually can run more pods uh, on top of what uh, we currently can offer. But as I mentioned just now, these are actually reclaimed resources. and not all suitable, uh, not all services are actually suitable to run on these sort of ephemeral resources. So um, even though these resources are currently idle, they might be needed in the future by the ports that actually originally requested them. And thus, these resources should not be considered to be really um, potentially short-lived in nature. So what we did, in our company, we introduced a new category of services known as batch services. 
And these workloads should be able to run on demand to make use of the idle resources that I described earlier that are reclaimed from other user-facing online services. As compared to an online service which low, uh, requires lower latency and high availability, we expect that batch services should be able to tolerate much more disruptions, and this may include lower availability or even evictions. Some examples of uh, batch services in our company include big data spark jobs, as well as certain non-real-time media transcoding tasks. So by downgrading suitable services to this batch service level, not only did we unlock a new class of resources that is much larger than before that we can now tap into, but this also helped us to free up uh, the scarce uh, resource for other online services to use. In order to support the co to the co-location of both online and batch services on the same node, we make use of several techniques uh, that are available in the Linux kernel. So for one, we set a lower CPU dot weight uh, inside the C group uh, for batch services, which ensures that other online services uh, will always get the highest share of CPU, uh, CPU time when they need it. We also made some adjustments to the Linux kernel's CPU scheduler, actually, which allows online C groups to preempt batch C groups through a concept known as uh, borrowed virtual time, or BVT. This way, we can still ensure that the latency SLA, uh, SLOs for online services uh, can still be retained and they can respond to bursts of user traffic when it needs to in a timely manner at the expense of simply just delaying the execution of the batch, uh, uh, batch services in the CPU for a sh uh, short while. Since these resources are ephemeral, they can be reclaimed by the online services at any point in time, as I described just now. So in this example, we can see that the online services utilization as represented in blue could actually increase, uh, increase uh, further. And this actually uh, corresp uh, results in the corresponding batch CPU uh, resource to actually decrease. So we already allocated the batch workload. So what, what can we do now? So when these batch workloads are, uh, because we, we have the kernel um, uh, features that we enable, so this might result in the batch workloads to be throttled. And they could actually be throttled for a really long time if the utilization of the online services uh, persists for a really long time. And this might result in the batch uh, workloads to fail to make forward progress. And they might even be hung indefinitely. So what we'll need to do is we'll need to eventually evict these batch workloads from the node so that we can run them on another node which has more idle resources available instead. So this presents our first challenge with using such resources. If the node's resource utilization fluctuates very wildly and frequently, what we might observe is a high rate of eviction of batch workloads and frequent disruption to uh, what the batch pods are trying to do. This is not ideal since they might not actually get to get, manage to get any work done if they uh, keep entering a schedule and evict, schedule and evict cycle. So because of this, some of our batch service users uh, also require a non-trivial grace period. So for example, our in-house Presto team requires an SLA that we need to provide a 60-minute graceful shutdown period uh, in order to minimize the interruption penalty on their users' queries. So uh, just as an example, if these jobs were to be interrupted suddenly, their users' queries would need to be restarted all the way from the beginning and this would uh, result in throwing away all of the previous com computation and waste all the resources that were consumed up to this point, and this whole exercise would be futile. But on the other hand, if we don't interrupt these, these pods in time, they might start to be throttled indefinitely. And because we set the C group settings, we have no control over when uh, we would actually uh, release the resources back to them. So even if we do wait for one hour before terminating the pods, uh, but if the pod doesn't actually get to use any CPU or use a very little amount of CPU, this whole thing would be pointless and it's simply pro prolonging the inevitable uh, after one hour. So some of the problems I've mentioned earlier are scheduling challenges that can be addressed with a little bit of foresight into the future. So before we get into the details about how we can do this through forecasting to address the scheduling challenges, let's first dig a little bit into the theory about how we can do this. We'll first consider two time horizons for forecasting. The first of which is short term, which focuses on the immediate trend and the likely trajectory of a signal. And the next is a long term forecasting, which focuses on the patterns such as cyclical changes in the resource utilization. 
each uh, kind of forecasting can be used for different goals and objectives. We use short-term forecasts primarily to solve the problem of flapping where a metric may, uh, may fluctuate up and down repeatedly. Our goal here is actually is to make the metric appear more smooth, which will help us to tolerate short-lived spikes in a metric, for example, like CPU usage, and this can help to reduce the number of unnecessary evictions. On the other hand, for long-term forecasts, our goal instead is to predict the, long, the future resource usage of a given service, and in so doing, help the scheduler to make smarter placement decisions of ports onto the node. So let's start by look, uh, diving into short-term forecasting. In the graph above, we can see that CPU usage might fluctuate very wildly, uh, the blue line, right? And this might affect how we perform eviction and resource advertisement. So what we need to do is to find a way to smoothen out, smoothen out the underlying signal, or in this case, the CPU usage, so that we can avoid evicting the workloads unnecessarily. At the same time, we'll need to distinguish short-lived spikes from long-term increases in CPU usage, and we also need to detect this quickly. Our chosen approach here is to make use of exponentially weighted moving average, or EWMA for short, which is a variant of the moving average but it's actually more sensitive to re uh, relatively recent changes as compared to, say, five minutes ago. We use the EWMA together with a confidence band to perform anomaly detection. So if the value is larger than our tolerated confidence interval of, say, three uh, standard deviations, this prompts a corresponding reaction, such as to increase or decrease the amount of advertised resources or to perform an eviction accordingly. Using the EWMA is superior to a simple moving average since it would be able to detect genuine increases much more quickly as compared to just a simple moving average. I also mentioned earlier that some of our users, the Presto team that I mentioned just now, also require longer graceful shutdown periods of one hour. We can't use a short-term forecast for this because now we actually have to predict an hour into the future. And instead, we'll need to adopt a different kind of forecasting method. Uh, as you can tell, I'm going into the long-term forecasting section. And to find something that is aware of the long-term trend, the seasonality, and cyclical properties of an online services utilization. So unlike a short-term forecast, uh, the long-term forecast is able to help the scheduler make smarter decisions in advance, such that we can place the batch ports to ensure that within the next one hour at least, the batch ports are able to run to completion without having to suffer from throttling or eviction. So that's the whole idea. Let's dive right into how we can perform long-term forecasting. So if we just look at the utilization or the CPU utilization of a node, this actually might not be very useful because containers might be, or ports might be added or removed from a node. We cannot simply just take the node's past utilization to predict the future utilization since it will be incorrect whenever we, just, we, whenever we add a port or ports are removed from the node. As such, we need to break down the constituents of the node's utilization, which might include uh, online service ports, uh, other batch jobs that are running on it, as well as other supporting services that could include con uh, ContainerD, Kubelet, and the kernel, which uh, we call daemon services over here. So after breaking down, uh, breaking down these parts, we can now analyze the pattern on a per-service level. For CPU usage, it's quite common for services to have usage patterns that are periodic in nature and uh, changes throughout the day. For instance, uh, there may be a lot more users on the Shopee app, in our case, during the lunch and evening periods, and lesser users during office hours or at night when they are sleeping. Some of our services may serve users from a single time zone, while other services may serve users across multiple time zones and those services might see multiple peaks. For such services, their CPU usage often reflects the real world user's behavior patterns and would be affected by real world events which could be seasonal and this could include uh, weekends, monthly campaigns, public holidays or even elections. So now that we are familiar with the characteristics of resource, resource usage, how do we go about, go about forecasting it? So we may know the periodicity of certain resource usage patterns. In the case of CPU, which largely follows user behavior on a daily basis, one can assume that CPU usage has a periodicity of 24 hours. And as such, one very simple solution is to simply reuse the past day's uh, value for predicting the current or the future day's value. So while this might seem very ex extremely simplistic and naive, 
This is actually the basic idea behind our forecasting method. In production, uh, what we would do is to actually take the last 14 days of data to pre predict the utilization for the next 24 hours. We may also need to deal with imperfections in data collection. As we are currently using Prometheus for uh, data collection, uh, this collects data by scraping the metrics endpoint, but what if the endpoint was temporarily unavailable? So if there was a timeout, for example, we might not have an observation for that time period. But fortunately, we can make use of uh, regular data imputation methods such as backfill interpolation and forward fill to fill up these gaps. So what we do is we make use of denoising approaches to handle outliers and noise to provide a more smooth forecast. So since we have data that is known to be periodic in nature, so what we did is to adopt a Fourier transform for this approach. So in order to denoise data, what we did is we first used uh, FFT, or the fast Fourier transform function, to transform data into its frequency domain. Within the frequency domain over here, uh, noisy signals or high frequencies that we saw previously would actually be transformed into regions of lower amplitude. So we can actually remove these low amplitudes via a low-pass filter and then transform the signal back using the inverse FFT function to transform the, to, to get back a denoise signal in the, uh, from the time domain. So we use the uh, Fourier transform approach not just for denoising, but in fact, it also helps us to forecast signals with any periodicity, not just 24 hours or daily uh, periods. For example, a service might have a period of like a weekly pattern instead. And using FFT, we can actually predict the future value of any periodic signal once we're able to break down the signal into its parts. And when, as uh, you might know, so um, uh, every signal consists of many sine waves of varying frequencies, amplitudes, and phases, and FFT helps us do just that. So this essentially means that using the FFT approach, we can generate forecasts for different services even without knowing their periodicities in advance, regardless if it's, it is an hourly, daily, or even a weekly pattern. Uh, we also needed to take care when consuming forecasts to handle sudden spikes or breaks in between forecast boundaries. The jump in values between two distinct forecasts uh, may introduce certain artifacts that didn't exist in the underlying signal, or this is what we call phantom spikes. So how we avoided this is to overlap multiple time series of separate prediction cycles over each other and use interpolation to simply uh, gradually transition the values uh, from one time series into another. So the result is we'll get a single forecast that is very smooth and removes all of the phantom spikes that I mentioned earlier. So with all this in hand, we can now go back to our favorite example as I shared earlier, uh, whether where our batch jobs that need to run Presto queries need a long graceful shutdown period of 60 minutes to avoid wasted computation. Well, now we have a long-term forecast available and we can see that, for example, within the next hour, uh, our forecast tells us that the node is expected to have a sharp increase in usage due to a predicted CPU usage spike for a particular service B. Yeah, so on the scheduler, this means that we should refrain from putting new batch pods onto the node at this point in time. And our forecast tells us that this is, there is a strong likelihood that those pods will be evicted within the next hour. So for the existing batch pods that were already present on this node, the graceful shutdown period, uh, sorry, a graceful shutdown procedure can be, proceeded, can be triggered on the batch pods to start relocating them to other nodes, which gives them, gives them actually a timeout of one hour before they get forcefully evicted from the node before the predicted search will actually start to happen. So this, uh, how do we actually implement all of this in production? So this is our very brief architecture diagram. First, we'll need to collect all of the container and node resource utilization metrics via Prometheus as I described earlier. This data can then be ingested into a data warehouse, data warehouse where it can be accessed through Hive tables. We can then make use of data pipelines using Spark to perform batch processing on the captured metrics where the forecasting functions can then be implemented in the form of a user-defined function or a UDF. Then the forecasts are then put back into the Hive tables where they can be queried again later. So how all of this ties in the Kubernetes, we, in KubeScheduler itself, we have implemented a custom plugin that can read the forecast data stored on the Hive table previously. And then we adjust the filter stage to exclude nodes that have a, that have a high risk of eviction as I described previously. 
So I've explained how we've managed to come up with a somewhat simple model that allowed us to perform long-term forecasting to predict the future usage for a particular service. But can we do even better? While our simplistic and naive model can have def uh, decent accuracy to predict the uh, actual utilization, we found several limitations that, that can't be easily overcome. So there are some notice noticeable deviations that you can see over here between the green and blue lines, uh, between the forecaster and actual observations, and this shows much room for improvement. Firstly, this model is not able to react to changes in trends quickly because it assumes a perfectly repeating pattern and thus, we can observe an error that could potentially last for a few days, uh, even after a service's utilization has drastically changed. Another significant limitation is that this model can't handle seasonalities of longer durations. Uh, for example, there could be a monthly campaign or public holidays that happen once a year. So we currently use the past 14 days worth of data as our input, and we would have to massively scale up the amount of input data to be processed just to support longer term seasonal patterns. And it's currently impractical if we need to do this for every single microservice in the company. We've also considered other several complex models available in the community. And one such model we tried out was uh, Profit, an open source forecasting model released by Meta. As we can see, Profit was able to start accounting for newer trends much earlier than our naive FFT model, and thus minimizing the amount of days that the forecasted value was mispredicted. But that being said, although these so-called more complex models can op offer superior accuracy and able to tolerate changes in the underlying trends better, they are often much costlier, and the performance of the prediction step does not scale as well. This is because most of the statistics Sorry, statistical models are not global in scope, and thus every single unique microservice needs a separate training and fitting cycle, and this has to be repeated tens of thousands of times for every single unique microservice that we have. So another popular growing option is to leverage machine learning or deep learning models such as transformers, long short-term memory, or even linear models to perform forecasting. So unlike statistical models, which I've covered up to now, ML and DL models can be trained on a wider variety of data, and the same model can be used to perform inferences on more than one service with reasonable accuracy. Let's see how we can utilize DL models for our use case. We'll, we must note that for a more complex model, this will take more time to train given the same training data set as compared to a simpler model. And based on our experience, uh, using a more complex model does not necessarily give rise to better performance than a simpler model. For DL models, we are also interested in to see how well the model can generalize, or in other words, how well it can handle data it has not seen before. Additionally, we also hope that it's able to handle forecasts of any arbitrary time period and should not be restricted to the shorter time windows that uh, we are restricted to in our statistical models previously. This uh, pre-trained model can then be packaged and used for model inference later, such as part of a data pipeline for generating the forecast. Working with DL models also requires some development costs, for instance, uh, to figure out what kind of models we need and what hyperparameters to use. So what we can do is to automate part of these chores using uh, certain tools like Raytune in order to test hyperparameters in a distributed manner. We also found that uh, using covariates can help to improve the accuracy of the prediction, which in our case helps us to inject additional correlated variables into the model to make a better prediction. So for us, a good example of a useful covariate is uh, campaign events, so, uh, where we observe that utilization, utilization is very much different from the regular scenario on a daily basis. Since we know in advance when future campaigns will be held, this, campaign, uh, this model can then account for the anomalies auto automatically and adjust the forecasted result automatically. So now let's recreate our previous forecasting at architecture using the our models instead. We actually don't need to make too many changes to our original architecture. So over here, we simply just replace the forecasting function with a call to a UDF that will perform the model inference instead. The training step is decoupled from the actual forecasting pipeline. We can do the training using PyTorch on a distributed cluster using GPUs and export the model into a portable format using Onyx. And this can be directly used for online prediction. We can also periodically retrain the model in order to take account into recent changes to service patterns over time. 
So based on some of our very early findings using some of these models, we were able to get pretty good results for forecasting CPU utilization, but we'll need much more fine tuning to outperform the, the statistical models that we currently have in production. So with that, we uh, evaluated several forecasting models, including both uh, statistical and DL-based models. Uh, using the models we've tested, all of them have comparable accuracy, but the more complex models we've evaluated would handle anomalies or changes and trend much quicker uh, than the simpler models that I described. Ad another additional thing is that stati statistical models are also easier to reason about and thus easier to debug. And this turns out it actually makes it much simpler to use and push the production to handle the most common scenarios, and that's why it's in production right now. Certain models also have a prohibitively higher cost during inference, which makes it costlier when working with thousands of unique time series. So despite its simplicity, we've actually found much greater success in using uh, the naive FFT models in production at the moment. But we're also currently ru quickly running into certain roadblocks that can only be solved by fine tuning these more complex models to overcome them in the future. So far, we've covered how we can make use of forecasting of uh, node utilization for the purposes of running batch workloads on a single node. But there's a lot more we can do with these uh, powerful techniques to forecast uh, a, a services utilization in the future. And this allows us to achieve higher resource utilization and improve resource density across our entire fleet uh, at the same time while minimizing business impact. So in Kubernetes, we know that we can oversell resources by setting the resource request lower than the limit. These resources are configured by developers in charge of the service, and this, uh, in, uh, and this gives rise uh, to challenges for us as platform maintainers in our company. So for one, in Shopee, the business PICs are often risk averse and would very much prefer to over-provision their resources, especially for a new service which might not yet be fully optimized. And since they are focused on stability, PICs would rather avoid changing these configurations even after their service was uh, optimized in the future because, you know, if it ain't broke, why fix it, you know? Additionally, microservices in our company are also partitioned by the target region that it serves, and as such, a larger market like Indonesia would require much more resources than, say, Singapore. However, PICs would tend to reuse the same configuration across all regions, resulting in certain regions that are much, uh, very much over-provisioned. Since we're approaching Kubernetes scheduling via a data-driven perspective, let's do this in a smarter way instead. Since we have access to the historical metric for each service, we can actually generate long-term forecasts for each of them to automatically derive the requests and limits for the service, and we don't have to depend on the inconsistent configuration from the application PICs. With this approach, the amount of resources allocated can slowly approach the true utilization of the service, and this improves the resource uh, efficiency of our fleet over time. To refine this even further, we can consider the resource utilization of services throughout periods of the day. So remember earlier I mentioned that our end user facing services are very much mirror the behavior of our users in the real world. So this results in very different usage patterns uh, throughout the day across different services that service different markets across different time zones. As such, certain services may face peak usage at different times from others due to differing time zones. And we can then exploit this fact by placing services that serve different time zones on the same node. And this uh, allows us to use a more aggressive oversell factor. And this can be done using extended resources as I show over here. We can avoid packing too many services that peak at the same time on the same node, and thus uh, oversell the resources instead to other services that are not expected to peak at the same time. This information can all be derived from the long-term forecast of the services utilization that I described earlier. We can also use our forecast to improve our HPA or horizontal port auto-scaling. So typically, the HPA depends on a specific CPU utilization target to be hit before scaling up the number of replicas. So in some cases, this might already be too late, and uh, the business impacts might actually already be start to be noticed. Since we know the utilization forecast for a service beforehand, this allows us to easily predict the number of replicas that are needed to keep the CPU utilization within its target range. And this allows us to preemptively scale up scale service in advance so that any large spike in CPU during regular usage peaks won't cause any noticeable degradation to the user experience. 
And now that we're using forecasted projections instead of the developer's configured settings, we now face a potential problem. When services are updated with new features or start serving more user traffic or get sunset over time, their utilization might also dramatically change over time. As such, if there's any changes to the projected uh, resource utilization, we'll also need to modify the port's resource request at the same time. Thankfully, uh, in-place updates of port resources are supported since Kubernetes 1.27, and this allows us to change uh, the resource spec for existing ports without needing to do a costly redeployment. Additionally, to avoid frequent flapping of the port's resource values that may result in uh, frequent rescheduling, we can also leverage the short-term forecast techniques I described earlier. So in the event that vertically resizing the port is not feasible, we can then relocate the port to another machine. We can make use of a descheduler to explicitly remove the port after verifying that we can move it elsewhere. Since we now have a much greater insight into the future of our port utilization, this allows us to further improve node, node density on, as a whole on, in the whole cluster. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with cluster autoscaler, which can help to scale down nodes that are not uh, needed, but yet all ports resource requests can still be satisfied. Using our projected forecasts, this helps us to reduce the total number of resources that need to be allocated. But for us at Shopee, where we make use heavy use of on-prem machines, we can't easily reap the benefits of uh, decommissioning a node as easily as compared to using the cloud. So what else can we do? So for on-prem scenarios, we actually start to be creative and we actually start to uh, set some, uh, we, we ex instead we control the C state of the CPU and this allows it to downclock and enter a lower energy consumption state. So this is actually beneficial because we can't afford to completely shut down the machines that are not needed because it may take a couple of minutes to start back up. What if it doesn't start back up, you know? Yeah, so uh, if it's not really suitable for real-time reaction to scale up events. The, uh, our findings is that this can save up to 60 watts per machine and when applied to thousands of machines across our fleet, this is quite significant. And aside from putting the machines in low power state, there's also other things that we can do with uh, these unused machines. So we could temporarily convert the node into use for other bare metal applications or for other uh, non-Kubernetes applications. So this actually allows us to share resources with other teams not yet running on Kubernetes without having to bear the upfront cost of them migrating to Kubernetes just yet. We can also choose to simply shut down the machine, uh, but as I mentioned earlier, this uh, requires a much longer lead time. So this is where forecasting can actually come in useful. I will just skip this slide. So how can we detect when uh, we need to scale these nodes back up? For one, we can use the cube scheduler backlog or the number of pending ports to detect that the cluster is indeed starved of resources. However, this might oftentimes be too late. So what we also do is to monitor the allocation ratio of CPU and memory resources and always retain a small buffer that can be used for port scheduling at all times. And to reclaim the nodes, we can quickly convert a node back from the low power state back to the normal C state. Additionally, we can also start to boot up back some of the machines that we may have powered off earlier. And since there's a pretty high overhead when switching the node between low power state and uh, normal state, we want to reduce the occurrence of this happening. So there are certain scenarios which are fairly predictable, uh, and this we can take from our service utilization forecast. So this also allows us, we can predict, to predict the node scale up events in advance. And this also gives us a grace period that we can use to handle any node reboot or node provisioning procedures before the ports are ready to be scheduled. So if you've been paying close attention, you might notice that this graph is very similar to the same graph that I showed earlier. And basically that's the idea of the sharing. <laughs> so to wrap up, we have explored various ways to leverage forecasting for batch and online services from a node level, all the way up to techniques for improving resource efficiency at the cluster level. We've started by showing how we can make use of short-term forecasting to reduce volatility of the input signal in order to minimize unnecessary reactions such as evictions uh, in response to short-term fluctuations. We also showed how we have uh, used long-term forecasting to handle reactions that ne need some time to take effect such as with full shutdown of batch jobs and the reclamation of nodes from a low power state or from a powered off state. And through these forecasting techniques, we have also demonstrated various ways to improve the resource density through automating oversell and cluster auto scaling. So with that, I'd like to end today's sharing. 
So I hope you learned something today about how you can make use of forecasting techniques to improve cost efficiency in your organization. If you would like to leave any feedback on this session, you can do so by scanning this QR code. And if you have further questions, feel free to reach out to me on the CNSCF Slack. Yeah, so thank you. I think we have time for one question. Uh, hi, first of all, amazing speech. Thank you so much. Uh, very relevant right now. Uh, you said that you use the statistical model profit. Did you try the neural profit? Yeah, actually we did. So uh, actually my teammate Nicholas tried out neural profit, but unfortunately he's not here today. And I think he's much more familiar with the results. Uh, I think we still need much more time to fine tune the neural profit because I think the performance over here was non-negligible for us to actually use in production at the moment. Yeah. If I remember correctly, the neural uh, perfect is the yeah more advanced uh, than the original perfect, and actually, uh, the the result showing the slider we actually we are based on the neural perfect to do do the pro prediction. Yeah, yeah. But Nicholas can, unfortunately, he's not here. Can now share more detail and code to you. <laughs> yeah, you can reach us reach us on Slack, and I think he'll reply you there. Right? So, yeah, I, I was also going to ask something about forecasting. Did you try reinforcement learning instead, maybe, to just first on the available statistical data, then while it is uh, working on the production, it can also continue learning. Like when it fails, it's a punishment. When it go, does well, does well. So. Yeah, thanks for your question. I think for reinforcement learning, it's uh, that one is more like agent based, so it's kind of like what what do you do when you react to a certain scenario, right? But for us, we're more interested in actually just predicting the future. So it's actually more uh, it's more suitable to use forecasting techniques. But actually, how some over here, my manager, he actually uh, have he actually had another sharing which relates to reinforcement learning. So maybe you can share. Yeah, we have a sharing a couple of days ago, but it's in Kuba AI days. It's introduced how we use reinforced learning to uh, this scaling. Yeah, because I think there are, there are fundamental difference between reinforced learning and uh, uh, no, normal uh, like yeah forecasting. Because forecasting is just prediction, but for the reinforced learning, is make decision in we change the state. So. It's the fundamental difference. So yeah, for the forecasting, may suit no suitable for the reinforced learning. Yeah. Have much more accurate okay. um, yeah, accurate uh, forecasting. We can just uh, yeah adopt uh, more accurate uh, time series uh, models instead of uh, using the reinforced learning. Yeah. Reinforced learning. Yeah. What, what we try to change in the reinforced learning is the agent. Usually, you, you may take. Actions uh, may be more suitable for the scary or this girl. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think I need to return the mic right now. So if you have any questions, I I'll be right here so you can answer. I have to answer any queries. Yeah. Thanks.